Bibles to jo Joshua chapter 14. We're talking about Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Kenzanite. Let's say, uh, real fancy name, uh, Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Kenzanite. As I was working on this message this week, I, I was thinking, boy, you know, I, I've done a, a drama on, on Peter. I've done a, a drama on John. Uh, the Apostle John, Son of Thunder, Apostle of Love. I did one on one of the wise men who, who was just an apprentice to the wise men uh, that I just kind of made up and put it together but told the Christmas story way, way, way back, like uh, 13 years ago, 12 years ago, here at the church. And I was like, you know, Caleb would be an incredible person to do a, a, a one-man monologue drama on because he was such a, an inspirational person person or is an inspirational person and he should inspire you no matter how old or how young you are as we look at him this morning we're going to begin with Joshua chapter 14 beginning with verse 6 uh, you'll have to look in your Bibles I don't have notes on the screen because I didn't get back till about 8 30 Friday night and then yesterday with the children's breakfast and or the yeah, pancake breakfast and stuff I didn't get the PowerPoint done but we have the, you have a Bible in the chair, so you can pull out. Uh, Joshua is Matthew, or Matthew, but it's in the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua. So it's the sixth book in the Bible. So beginning with verse, chapter 14, verse 6. A delegation from the tribe of Judah, led by Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Kinsanite, came to Joshua at Gilgal. Caleb, the name means bold and impetuous. And that, that's really good because Caleb was a bold person, you know, pretty similar. He reminds me of, later on in the New Testament, Peter. Uh, but his name also can mean, uh, an animal mean, an animal name meaning dog. Dog. And in this play, it will play into things in just a little bit. Uh, the Kenzanites are listed in Genesis chapter 15, verse 19, as one of the nation's who lived in the land of Canaan. Uh, the, at the time that God made the covenant with Abraham, saying, I'm going to give this land to your descendants. This is going to be yours. And uh, most likely the Kenzanites were descendants of Esau. How they, how they arrived in, in uh, Egypt, we don't know. Maybe they came the same time that Abraham's uh, kids all went uh, because of the family. We don't know. But Japuna, the Kinsanite, uh, may have ended up marrying uh, somebody from the tribe of Judah, which kind of uh, put them in along with the Judah, uh, Judah. So even though Caleb wasn't necessarily by uh, a full Israelite, he was by no means... Uh, a part of the Israelite party as they left Egypt heading to the promised land. He was Israelite indeed. Moving on, Caleb said to Joshua, Remember what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, about you and me when we were at Kadesh Barnea? I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me to Kadesh Barnea to explore the land of Canaan. The Israelites had come out of Egypt, and they had seen God work in some pretty profound, mighty ways. Uh, they had seen miracles as well as they had received some discipline from God as they whined and complained. They, they received some discipline. They had received the Ten Commandments. They had received the. They had seen the provisions of God, and they had seen His power manifested. All from the time that they, you know, from the time they were in Egypt with the plagues to the time that they are right here and near the edge of the promised land and they are sending out these spies. It goes on, second part of verse 7. I returned and gave an honest report, but my brothers who went with me frightened the people from entering the promised land. Caleb and Joshua were two of the twelve spies, and they came back. They had fruit that was 
huge and they were saying really this place is a land flowing with milk and money you we, we've got to go in and take it this is Caleb and Joshua God was telling the truth like God doesn't tell the truth like God lies we're gonna go in and do it it's gonna be great and then you have the other ten spies say but but it, it's true the land is flowing with milk and honey but there are giants in the land and they have fortified cities Come on, they had seen God destroy the Egyptians. They had seen him do some miraculous feats during that time. They had experienced his discipline. And now, all of a sudden, the God who delivered them from Egypt and told them this is the promised land, this is what you're going to have, they, they were saying, no, God can't give it to us. It's going to be too hard. We can't do it. We can't go in there and take this land. And they spread a bad report among the people. But Caleb did not. Caleb and Joshua said, come on, remember, remember the God who parted the Red Sea. Remember all those plagues. Remember how the Egyptians were destroyed. God will give us the land. He has already promised it to us. Let's go in and take it. Let's do it now. We can do it with squirt guns. Let's do it. For my part, I have wholeheartedly followed the Lord my God. He did not doubt God in any way, shape, or form. Verse 9, so that day Moses solemnly promised me, the land of Canaan on which you were just walking will be your grant of land and that of your descendants forever because you wholeheartedly followed the Lord my God. Verse 10, now as you can see, the Lord has kept me alive and well as he promised for all these 45 years since Moses made this promise. 45 years since Moses made the promise. He was 40 years old when he went to the promised land. Now here he is, 45 years old, uh, older. Do the math. 85 years old. Hmm. I am just as strong now as I was when Moses sent me out on that journey. This is verse 11. Oh, I should back up. Today, I'm 85 years old. Maybe it was his birthday, I don't know. I am just as strong now as I was when Moses sent me on that journey, and I can still travel and fight as well as I could then. So give me the hill country that the Lord promised me. You'll remember that, that as scouts, we found the descendants of Anak living there, in great wall towns. But if the Lord is with me, I will drive them out of the land, just as the Lord said. The descendants of Anak were these giants. They were big, they were strong, they were fierce. So Joshua, verse 13, blessed Caleb, son of Jephunneh, and gave him Hebron to him as his portion of the land. Hebron still belongs to the descendants of Caleb, son of Jephunneh, the Kinzonite, because he wholeheartedly there it is, a third time. He wholeheartedly followed the Lord, the God of Israel. Previously, it, Hebron had been called Kirath Arba. It had been named after Arba, a great hero of the descendants of Anak. And the, the land had rest from the war. Caleb was one of the chief spies sent out by Moses. He was courageous. He was courageous and he persevered no matter what. He persevered in spite of the other spies with their discouragements. He was invincible in driving out giants in the land later on at 85 years of age when he went to take the land God had given him. He was devoted to God wholeheartedly even in his old age. Six times it's recorded of Caleb that he had followed the Lord God wholeheartedly. Wholeheartedly. Caleb was an incredible, credible man. He wholeheartedly served God. He loved God with all of his heart, soul, mind, and strength. He relentlessly pursued God no matter what. In spite of the obstacles, his courage was unfaltering. Giants 
didn't scare him. And neither did those who threatened to stone him within the Israelite community. Caleb overcame all sorts of obstacles. He overcame self-esteem. His, his name could be interpreted as dogs. He wasn't a full-blooded Israelite at that time, or at any time. He wasn't a full-blooded Israelite, and so people looked down on him. When I was young, people used to use the derogatory term, oh, they're a half-breed, as a derogatory term. And it wasn't said kindly. I could imagine people saying that type of thing about Caleb. He's just a half-breed. He's a dog. And look down upon him. His, his identity was not found in what other people thought about him. His identity was not found in his profession. His identity was not found in his parents. His identity was found in God and who God thought he was and said he was. I don't know about you this morning. Maybe you struggle with self-esteem issues. Maybe you've been made fun of in the past. God doesn't look at what other people say, says. He looks at you. I remember in fifth grade walking to band class, and I heard when I came back that the, the teacher, as I was carrying my snare drum, in my big box, and here I am, not that big, and I'm carrying this big old snare drum, and I'm walking, and I probably had my pie pants on with my, my checkered vest uh, and, and my paisley circle uh, elephant bloom sleeve things, uh, very uncoordinated. And I was heading to the band, and the teacher turned to the class, and she said, he'll never make it. And that bird, when I got back, that bird within me, never make it. I'm sure Caleb had people saying things, you're just a dog, you're just a half-breed, you will never make it. But his identity was not found in what other people said about him. His identity was found in God and God himself. Because God looked at Caleb, God looks at you, and he says, you are someone special. You are someone that I have made in my image, and I want to use you. I want to use you. So he overcame the self-esteem. He overcame the crowd. The crowd again and again murmured against God. They are all, we can't take the promised land. They're giants. It's not possible. We can't do it. And Caleb said, yes, we can. Yes, we can. And there are times he threatened to be stoned, but God protects him and protected Joshua. And they, he overcame the crowd. He did not join in with the crowd. He stood firm. He wholeheartedly devoted himself to God. He, he overcame the obstacle of time. For 40 years, because of their disobedience, because they said, oh, it's not possible for us to take the promised land. For 40 years, they wandered in the desert as people died off and said it wasn't possible. I'm sure for 40 years, he's like, man, when are we going to go into the promised land? How much longer do we have to keep walking around out here, uh, eating this manna, eating the quail, and, and wondering what's going to happen? When are we, am I going to get that land that God has promised? I can't wait to get there. Have you ever had that time where you just can't wait to get there? I tell you, I tell you, coming home, coming home from Indiana. I was going to Indiana, coming back, the closer you get it, and the longer the time goes, I'm like, I am ready to get there. I can't wait to get there. And the pedal, the foot gets just a little bit heavier on the pedal, and you have to be conscientious and use the cruise control. But Buck, he is always really good. He doesn't have that happen at all. He's right there. Same with Jonah. They're amazing. <laughs> I got your back. Yeah. Yeah, I won't say that you made it home in six hours. I'm just kidding. Anyway. Yeah, he's probably wondering when I'm going to be there. When, when you have a promise and it seems that it's taking forever, it's easy to get discouraged. Yet he did not get discouraged. Forty years and then he finally gets to cross over to the, the River Jordan to take the land that God has promised them. And for five years he's battling, he's fighting. At 80 
years from 80 to 85, he's going in and he's battling and taking the land. And he's fighting to take the land for all the other tribes of Israel. But yet he still has not gotten the land of Canaan that God has promised to him. I'm sure, God, I'm taking this land for so many other people. When? When do I get my inheritance? They've got theirs. They're getting theirs. They're getting theirs. We're talking about those people. How much longer, God? When do I get mine? Yet, it doesn't say he did that. He was faithful. And in spite of time, he kept persevering. He kept persevering. He kept fighting on. He overcame the obstacle of age. I tell you, the older I get, I, I know I don't do things the way I used to. I don't have quite the energy that I used to. Be 52 this next Friday, or this upcoming Friday, the 5th. It's amazing. It happens like almost every year. Every year. Age can drag us down. And he overcame that and continued to fight on. He overcame fear. Max Lucado writes, Fear never wrote a symphony or a poem, negotiated a peace treaty, or cured a disease. Fear never pulled a family out of poverty or a country out of bigotry. Fear never saved a marriage or a business. Courage did that. Faith did that. People who refused to consult or cower to their timidities did that. But fear itself? Fear herds us into a prison of unlocked doors. Wow. He overcame fear. He did not let it get a grip on him. Lose the grip and trust God. Don't let fear be a bully in your life. Because fear will keep you from doing what God has called you to do. There are a lot of individuals who have achieved things. We think, oh, if I only had the energy of the young, I could do such great things. If I had all this wisdom, and all this, all that that I have now, but yet also with all that energy of young. Don't underestimate. Don't underestimate for those of you that are younger what God can do through you as you are wholeheartedly serving Him, and don't underestimate those of you who are older what God can do in and through you. God can use you no matter what the age. For those over 50, People begin to sit back and they start counting down the days to retirement when they can sit down in their rocking chair and just enjoy life. Caleb, I don't read about Caleb doing that. He continued to fight on. 85. He said, I want that land. And he's going to battle giants. Grandma Moses, the, the spry and indomitable, gen, uh, genuine American primitive writer. Didn't write her first, or paint, excuse me, paint her. Didn't paint her first picture until she was 76 years of age. Arthritis had gotten to her and she could no longer knit, so she took up painting. And she became a great painter, age of 76. The first American to orbit the earth, John Glenn, made history again when, the, when at the age of 77, he became, became the oldest person to orbit the Earth uh, again. He wrote the Space Shuttle Discovery, and over the course of nine days, the shuttle orbited the Earth 134 times at the age of 77. In August of 2004, Dorothy Davenhill, at the age of 89. Is anybody in here 89? How many of you are younger than 89? Yeah, everybody in here is younger than 89. At the age of 89, she reached the North Pole. The North Pole. And was designated by the Guinness Book of World Records as the oldest person to reach the remote destination. Peter Rogan invented the thesaurus at the age of 73. Noah Webster completed the American Dictionary for the English language at age 66. It took him 26 years to complete it. Colonel Sanders started KFC at the age of 65. He received his first Social Security check of $99 and he said, something's not right. Something's got to change. And he went out and he started KFC, traveling around and selling his product 
and now there's KFC all over the United States and all over the world. 65. Benjamin Franklin signed the Declaration of Independence at the age of 70. John Pimperton invented Coca-Cola at the age of 55. The inventor of RC Cola was younger, I checked it out, so I could use him as an illustration. But Coca-Cola was age 55. Many of you that are young, older, used to watch Little House on the Prairie, and you've heard of Laura Ingalls Wilder. She published her first novel when she was 65 years of age. President Donald Trump, Donald J. Trump, became the oldest president ever elected for the first time at the age of 70. Now, President Reagan, he, he was over 70 when he was elected the second time, but the first time he was younger. He will be, he will be, Donald Trump will be 71 years of age this June. And it was the first time that he ever ran for political office. Whether you agree with him or not, what President Obama did, or people said that he did, to bring uh, validation to African Americans by being the first African American president, <coughs> Donald Trump has brought validation to senior adults by being the oldest senior adult elected as president. The list goes on and on. Caleb was 85 years of age when he received his inheritance. And he received the reputation <laughs> at that age in life. At 85 years of life, he received the reputation of being a giant killer. And I'm sorry, you may think, well, back in Bible days, they lived longer. 85 was old back then. And he received the reputation of being a giant killer. In fact, he and Joshua, they were the oldest ones in the Israelite nation. Because everybody else had died out because they were the naysayers. So it was only the children. Moses didn't even get to go into the promised land. Joshua and Caleb led the people into the promised land. They were the oldest ones living. Wow. 85 years of age, receiving the reputation of being a giant killer. Why? Because he persevered. He had tenacity. He did not give up. Why? Because he was obedient to God. Not because he feared hell, but because he loved God. Why? Because he wholeheartedly Follow God and loved Him with all of His heart, soul, mind, and strength. This Friday, I will be 52 years of age. And at 52 years of age, a lot of people start counting down the days to retirement. Some of us, you know, there are some guys my age that are already retired. Other people, you know, 62, 65, 67, whatever it may be, they start looking forward to that retirement and they count, start counting down the days. And I don't read anywhere in the life of Caleb where he started counting down the days. My brother Maurice is an example of perseverance to me. And I, I've, I've sh shared this story before, but I'm going to do it again. Because uh, he's an example of perseverance and persistence. He is a person who, in spite of all sorts of physical issues, has kept his faith and not let his disabilities or his age, of course he's younger, He's 55, will be 55 this year. He hasn't allowed those things to define him. He has facial, scapular, humeral, muscular dystrophy. Same thing that they have diagnosed me with. Only he started getting all the results earlier in life. I've watched him over the years push himself and not give up. His attitude and determination has caused him to be successful in his career, his marriage, and his life. Years ago, when he was first diagnosed with the muscular dystrophy after joining the Army, he was, he was at boot camp, 
And my mom recounts that she received this phone call from his sergeant, from the commanding officer. And he said to her, when Maurice was in the army, I, or this is what my mom wrote, when Maurice was in the army, I received a phone call from his commanding officer. He called to tell me Maurice was in the hospital and had been diagnosed with muscular dystrophy. He said he'd been admitted because his legs gave out on him on a two-mile run carrying the backpack. He told me that Maurice would, would not quit. He crawled until he finished the two miles. He continued to tell me of his commitment and perseverance and his pursuit of excellence. My mom says I'm proud of his determination. He's an incredible illustration to me, an example of persistence, just as Caleb was. The storm has not let up for my brother Maurice. He, he now uh, rides in a motorized wheelchair. And when he does walk, he walks with a walker. And he falls. And he's had surgeries on his rotator cuff because of the falls. And he can't get himself up and has to call neighbors or whatever when he does fall to get him up. But it has not stopped him. He continues to go to work to Geico Insurance every day. He told me just this week when I was driving to Indiana, he said, uh, or actually when I was visiting my mom, he said, you know, I have nine months of vacation time and sick days built up. Nine months because he does not take the time off. Young people use everything for an excuse. He could have been on disability years ago, but he has fought through it all. And in addition, when he comes home from that, he, he goes to work on his computer, where he was on uh, the political action committee for Ben Carson, helping him to get drafted when he was running for president. And that political action committee has continued on. They've changed the names, and he's still uh, working for them doing stuff. So he spends 40 hours at work at GEICO, and then he comes home and spends another 20 or 30 hours working, doing all sorts of stuff. In fact, the little stickers with the little logos and signs you saw for Ben Carson running for president, my brother designed all those. He has not let it slow him down. He's continued to press on in spite of the things. Caleb pressed on. We are to continue to press on no matter what. Galatians 6 9 says, Do not become over. <coughs> Excuse me. Galatians 6 9. Do not become weary of doing good, for at the right time, right time, you will reap a harvest if you don't give up. Caleb served God wholeheartedly throughout all of those years. And he finally, sometime later into his 85th year, maybe his 86th, 87th, as he was fighting to kill the giants and, and get them out of the land, did he receive his inheritance because he did not give up. Uh, February 1st, 2018, this church will turn 80 years old. When this church turns 80 years old, the life expectancy of churches don't last much. It's like human life. They usually start their downward spiral long before that and don't last very long. You know, yes, you see some that are celebrating 100, 150, 200, but a lot of them close their doors. A lot of them close their doors. I believe the greatest days are ahead for this church. I believe God wants to do so much more through this church to see lives changed. And just as he used Caleb's perseverance, his tenacity, he will use you, he will use this church to see the lives transformed. Maybe it'll be this family that we're reaching out to with the love offering next Sunday. I'm praying it will be so. Maybe it will be somebody else. It could be that God raises up the next, the next Billy Graham through the ministry of this church. But we need Caleb's who will say, I've served God wholeheartedly. I want my mountain. And we go out full force. A year ago I was diagnosed with sarcoidosis some weird, freaky type of disease that I believe God has been healing me of. But also, the 
muscular dystrophy. Next May, or next May, May 9th, I will have a biopsy to determine exactly if it is the FSH, muscular dystrophy. But I, I, as my brother, as an example, I'm not going to give up. When I was carrying stuff down from three flights of steps, you know, I said Jonah was going to have to carry it all down, load it in the car since I was going to have to unload it. I lied. He hadn't even boxed up anything. <laughs> Buck, were you ahead of the game? Did you have it all boxed up? I loaded it all the time for myself, so I didn't really have to. See, I couldn't do this if you're going to give you a hug. I'm proud of you, Buck. We didn't even get it yet. Oh, wow. He only got two boxes. Yeah. Wow. But I was feeling it. And my brother Mark's like, you did really good today. I was like, yeah, I'm not going to give up. I believe the greatest days are still ahead for me, for this church. And on September 11th, September 11th, 2018, this church will celebrate 30 years of being in this location. And I believe it would be an incredible thing for this church to have a satellite campus that we launch by that point in time of September 2018 out in Franklin County where there are people that don't know Christ as well. It's been a vision for a long time and I'm excited that when we have the LCC, the local church conference, the business meeting where we elect the board and the trustees and we approve the church budget, that the church board has taken a step of faith and put a line item in the budget for church planting. The first time in 16 years, I've been talking about church planting for 16 years. You, you think, oh, we have to be a church of like 500 before we can have a satellite campus or plant a church. Well, uh, I can tell you this, I received a text message this morning from Randy Garner. He's a pastor up in uh, Northern Virginia, Williamsburg. And his church was running around 80 or 90 people when they planted their first church. And then their church was running about 150 when they planted their second church. They planted two or three churches now. And when you combine, and now his church runs about 180 people, I think, 170. And when you combine all of the different church plants that they have planted, they're talking about hundreds of people. And it all started because they had a vision. And they gave some of their best people away when they were running the eight, some of their top givers. But God provided and blessed. I believe, maybe we, we can say, oh, we only run like 120 people here at Penn Forbes. There's no way we can plant a church, have a satellite campus in, in Franklin County. Yes, there is a way. And as we step out in faith and are obedient, God will provide just as he has done for the past 16 years, just as he did for Caleb, and just as he has for you, and he will continue to provide. Why are we doing it for pats on the back? No, we're doing it to see the unchurched population reduced. Because right here in 24018, there are 20,000 people thereabouts, give or take, that are not, do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. That do not attend church. <coughs> in Franklin County, I, the, the, it's got a reputation of being pretty conservative, in spite of being the moonshine capital of the world. But 56, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, 56% of the population has no religious preference. That's a lot of people. That means that's more than half. So as I look around and I see my neighbors, half of them don't go to church, nor even have a relationship with Jesus Christ. We fare a little bit better here in Roanoke County. Or no, we fare a little bit worse in Roanoke County, 59%. According to the Census Bureau, but none. That means if there are 10 homes around you where you live, six of those homes don't have a faith in God. 
or they think, well, there may be some sort of God out there. But God can use you. God can use this church. And God can use me. Will we wholeheartedly pursue God and have the faith that Caleb did to say, I want that mountain. I want that mountain. No matter what you think about Jerry Falwell, he said, I want that mountain. And God give, gave it to him. And Liberty University is the number one Christian university in the world today, influencing people. And Andrea goes there. Indiana Wesleyan is the number one Christian, largest private Christian university in the state of Indiana, larger than Notre Dame. Buck and Jonah go there. And next year, Mason will. And, he, and uh, Allie does online stuff with them somewhat. No? She's filled with that. She'll get back to it more than likely. Huge the impact. May we continue to see lives in the <coughs> for the glory of God here at PFWC. Amen? Amen. Will you allow him to use you? Will you allow him to use you to relentlessly pursue God above your personal desires, above everything else? Because Caleb had to put his personal desires aside. Seriously, 85 years of age, don't you think he had some of his own personal desires to just sit back? Yet for five or 80 years of age, yet for five years, what did he do? He fought for the nation of Israel, for the kingdom of God, wholeheartedly. He did not give up. The greatest days are still ahead for Dave, for Betty. Myra, and I can go through every single individual in here. Elizabeth, Amy, Buck, and Andrew, and little Christiana, and Bob, and Lois. And you just put your name in there. The greatest days are still ahead as we wholeheartedly pursue God and the people. Would you stand with me as we pray? Father, thank you. I know there are kids out there, there are parents coming in. And they're going to be making their way in, and it's going to be pretty chaotic in a little bit. But you're the God that can bring peace in the midst of the chaos. You're the God that can see lives transformed and changed. And I stand up here this morning and say, God, I will pursue you. I will. Pull, I desire to wholeheartedly pursue you with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. And I desire to be like Caleb, who does not give up, who has tenacity and perseverance and did not let age or any of the other things hold him back. May I continue to press on no matter what. May we continue to press on and be the light that you have called us to be no matter what. In Jesus' name. And now... May the blessing of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be upon each one of you. May he make his face to shine upon you, to burn within you, in your spirit, a passion and a zeal that says, I want that mountain. Both now until the day God takes you home. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. And all God's people say, Amen. Go and go in peace. Love and serve. Our business agent.